So, let us come to the introduction of iron making. As I am not sure how many of you are aware of it, but in a human body we have about 4 gram of iron, which means iron essentially is a part of all living things. So, it is very important in our life. And as such iron as an element was forced by nucleosynthesis in all the nuclear furnaces of, of the stars. So, if you read about the evolution of the stars, you will come to know iron is formed by nucleosynthesis process. And history tells that iron was first produced from meteoroids and then to iron ore. And in fact, the name of iron comes, some say, say it, it is like a holy metal and it is also in the old days, they say the metal fall from sky. So, the first evidence is iron came in the form of meteoroids, so fell from sky and that is how they gave the name iron. If we look at uh, the percentage of iron in our earth, so it is about 35 percent, which is a very big amount. And but most of it is concentrated at the core of the um, earth at the center and it is inaccessible. So, we cannot reach due to very high temperature at the center. So, whatever is available belongs to the earth's crust and that is uh, the iron which we are using at present and this is about 5 percent of earth crust and some of the iron ores is hematite, magnetite which is which are shown here. So, beginning of <coughs> the metal is melting as you know it is started in Neolithic age and earlier evidence of exploiting metals like weeds of malachite and copper about 7250 BC. So, in fact, the iron age came quite late, uh, first the stone age, then copper age, bronze and then the iron age. So, iron has remained uh, at the core of the civilization for around 3000 years. The oldest known ferrous alloy production was about 2000 BC and probably it uh, may be more than sometime 2000, it is about 3000 actually in India, it is a written one. So, that definitely we can say in India it was about 3000 BC uh, and the Buddhist is still one of the um, main important uh, uh, iron process known is Buddhist Buddhist steel of India which uh, was used in making Damascus sword and exported worldwide about 2 million ago. And this is the uh, Damascus wood steel sword which went all over the world. And then another one we have around 15, 50 years old, the known as iron pillar. In Delhi, which is not rusted yet and quite he heavy, this is another marvelous of uh, Indian metallurgist. So, once uh, this slowly uh, after getting into this iron age, it is spread wide to wide geography area by 1350 to 1100 BC, and the evolution of technology in Europe and Asia have different timeline, which is a clear example of 
how development responds to local condition both geographic and economic. Uh, if you look at the history more closely you will find uh, these are very different different uh, timeline for Europe and Asia. So, it is difficult to say what has happened in Europe is true all over the world and same thing is about the Asia. So, it says human settlement where it has occurred uh, this technology developed. So, iron was produced by redu reduction of its oxides or hematite, magnetite, geothite, siderite etcetera and where human settlement had, had occurred as I said in the previous one and reducing agent was carbon and various form of wood or charcoal. Um, the feeling is uh, when the human was settled somewhere and they were probably burning the fire uh, and the earth or that place was iron rich they found sort of a nugget or some hard material and that is how this iron was discovered and this uh, it started. Uh, used. So, the first process to make steel was direct reduction process that produced unalloyed mild steel and modern iron iron making steel uses this 3000 year old process known as the carbothermic reduction because carbon is the main reductant here and that is how it is known as carbothermic reduction. The way it started and what we know it is in sort of a bloom used to produce and that place used to call bloomery. So, in that one it is used to have a bowl shaped clay heart of knee high and that one temperature. Uh, so, it is something like that and they are um, blowing the air through this into this pot which is uh, temperature is about 14 below 1450 Kelvin. So, that is below the melting point of iron, but it was high enough to reduce its oxide. However, this is spongy product which you get after reduction of oxide is not pure and that is why it is known as bloom consisting of iron slag and some impurities with the actually this video could show you uh, a little can give you a little idea about uh, um, Can we stop? Um, so, this spongy product known as bloom was consisting of iron slag and some impurities. The following movie gives you an idea about how the uh, blooms are produced. So, 
with the process of, uh, so you saw this uh, movie which uh, shows about the uh, expensive production of bloom um, in the old days, but you know as the time passed demand of this metal increases due to its hardness and other properties. So, with the passage of time and more demand high bloomers came into existence up to 0.5 meter high as you can see in the, the in this figure. <coughs> of course, this is a higher than that. So, more and more higher bloomers ca came. So, iron can only be separated from slag completely when both are in liquid state. So, as we were saying when the demand is more then production should get increased the mechanization of the thing came as you can see in this one the blowing is through the water. And as, so, this is mostly what you are seeing is about the art of iron making as the people wanted more and more things. So, they try little innovative idea and uh, started increasing the size of the bloomers and uh, more uh, production of the bloom. But with the increase of the demand I think this art was not sufficient to fulfill it. So, slowly slowly science and technology came into picture and the first use of coke was happened which because as you go high coal or charcoal or wood is does not have that sort of strength which can withstand the pressure of the material. So, they were restricted to it. So, invention of the cork came uh, through the coal. Then use of air blast because if bloom becomes high you need more and more air and with the invention of steam engine high power blower were available and that is how the air, air blast came into picture in iron making. And to increase the efficiency then preheating of the air blast started somewhere in 1829 and it is found that lots of heat is going west in the form of exhaust gases. So, utilization of that also started somewhere in 1845. So, essentially iron making what we have today is about 600 year old process. It is a part of the extractive metallurgy which is uh, classified into three types pyro, hydro and electro metallurgy and pyro metallurgy is related to the heat and this is the oldest branch of extractive metallurgy and iron making actually comes or falls under this branch pyrometallurgy. Now, coming to the modern uh, iron making not exactly, but uh, um, if we see the development of modern iron in steel making then this is around only 3 uh, quarter century old. So, about 7 or 8 decade. Um, so, pyrometallurgy is the oldest branch of extractive metallurgy and uh, uh, iron making falls under pyrometallurgy. Um, now, the modern iron making I will show you one video a small clip which will uh, uh, tell you about uh, um, how the iron is produced nowadays. This is the video.
So, this uh, clip showed you uh, some idea about the modern iron making um, and this is around 7 to 8 decade old and as the demand is increasing or the, uh, this one new and new technology is coming into this and due to the economy many of the technology has been changed and now economy is not the only thing environmental problems are there. So, many changes have occurred and as you can see from uh, this uh, slide that you have now burden it has to be size, weight, moisture control, all top case analysis um, or skin flow thermocouple, many types of bro probe and injection of the hot blast with um, fuel like pulverized coal injection, plastic, oil and there are so many things in the blast furnace which uh, is shown in these figures. So, nowadays blast furnace is quite sophisticated. So, essentially if you look at the whole history of it, what we see it is going from bloomery to high bloomers to mini blast furnace to the blast furnace and as you know due to the environmental problem and uh, scarcity of the high quality coal, people are going back to mini blast furnace and even to DRI which is like your blooms sponge iron and go, uh, then using this one into the uh, electric arc furnace to make the steel. So, bypassing the blast furnace. So, do not know after that what it would be, but it looks we are going in a cycle and if you look at in another way the reduction technology also seems to going in a cycle from solid state as the bloom then to liquid state uh, we are coming to the blast furnace liquid iron and slag and again is going to the solid state to DRI and then using electric uh, arc furnaces or other devices to make the steel. So, it seems again it is go going in a cycle and I will give you a little idea about the modern blast furnace uh, various zones what uh, is happening in it. So, this figure shows about the physical chemical description of the blast furnace. So, from the top we um, introduce raw material uh, where iron ore and coke is charged. Now, iron ore depends if it is just a lumpy iron ore then uh, it is followed with flux otherwise it could be only sinter or pellets followed by coke and this is a tube which distribute this uh, material across the cross sectional of this blast furnace and where you have a layer of iron ore and coke. Uh, side of this uh, is protected by refractory bricks and then the steel cell and cooling is done all around this and the hot air is goes through these nozzle pipes called tuyer and a big cavity is formed called raceway because the coke is racing around here and this uh, that produce CO which is highly reducing gas and that gas goes up and reduce this uh, uh, charge especially, especially the iron ore which is coming down from the top. So, slowly slowly this hematite to magnetite to iron ore it get redu reduces and when it comes somewhere over here it becomes semi molten in stage. So, sometimes you call this zone as a cohesive zone. So, either it is a B shaped zone or, or a W. So, this one is a W and this one is a inverted B shaped zone and after that the uh, whatever 
metal and slag is there it is in the liquid form and only solid um, cork is there. And so, this is a very hot zone. So, water cooling and other uh, is required in pay across all of this around the uh, furnace and this is known as Bastille pipe hot air is blown through this and your liquid iron and slag trickle down through this and there is a sort of a lump of the cork. I would say what we call it dead man because as such it does not take any part in the reaction or any other thing, but it supplies a mechanical strength to the burden. And from the bottom you uh, take out this uh, liquid slag and iron from the respective notch. So, this is a brief uh, description of the blast uh, modern blast furnace and nowadays they are quite automated and you would be surprised that uh, the maximum capacity at the moment is 17,000 ton per day. That is a very high uh, uh, capacity and I am not sure when I am talking to you at this time another blast furnace might have come with probably 18,000 ton per day or something. So, imagine it is started with only few ton per day to 500 to 1000 and now to the 17,000 ton per day. So, how much progress has been made in iron making and the below picture shows all automation and control of the blast furnace. So, mostly you um, measure various parameter top case composition, uh, temperature at various places in the blast furnace, a cooling system, permeability of the bed and all these are fed and if there is any discrepancies or uh, um, not falling under a certain range the value corrective measure is taken and that is how the whole blast furnace is controlled now through computers. Very few people work at the uh, work so at the plant. So, this is sort of a automation of this and just to give you an idea about the demand of uh, liquid metal. As you can see in 2015 actually this liquid uh, world production went up to almost 1200 million ton and after the uh, 2013 or 14 it is decreased a little bit and now uh, it is almost constant the this downward trend is due to because the all data are not available, but uh, if you go to 2016 it is uh, something somewhere here. So, which is uh, almost becoming a constant and but if you look at this is the word production the China it is due to the China which has produced so much hot metal due to their infrastructure development and now they are reducing their capacity uh, and India is coming up and India might be in another 5 years it would be going up to 300 million uh, or another 10 years actually up to 300 million ton. So, India need more infrastructure now. So, India is going up, China is becoming steady and other countries are ok. So, it seems um, the production would be steady if not decreasing. And the second figure shows how the iron demand of iron has increased over couple of century. So, you can see there are three metal which the demand of which has increased quite dramatically. One is nickel, you can see almost three magnitude order it has increased in last two century. Iron of course, about two magnitude order it has uh, increased, covert at the same time almost three magnitude, but now it is uh, becoming steady or little bit at the decline side, but iron is still continuing. So, still it has a de uh, demand and lots of infrastructure in various countries are uh, getting built. So, this uh, 
uh, demand of iron will not decrease in near future.